Okay, hello, thanks for coming to my talk. My name is Signat. I work for Cloudflare, and today we're going to talk about Linux disk encryption. Okay, a little bit about myself. So I do performance and security at Cloudflare. I'm also passionate about crypto, and I enjoy low-level programming. I like Linux kernel bootloaders and other scary C stuff. And okay, so data at rest. We will just go through a brief overview. Uh, basically, uh, we all know the operating system storage stack. You have the applications. You have they talk to file systems. File systems and they convert files to blocks, send it to the block subsystem, and the block subsystem actually talks to the real hardware. And when you're uh, considering different encryption scenarios, like encrypting data at rest, you can encrypt data at all of these layers. So like. You can encrypt data in hardware. You can have a self-encrypting dives. Uh, you can do the uh, block-level disk encryption, which is LuxD encrypt on Linux, BitLocker on Windows, FileVault on macOS. You can do it in, in the file system layer, uh, the old EcryptFS or the new FS crypt modules. And of course, you can do it in your application, so you can encrypt your data before actually trying to write it to the files. And each of these approaches have their pros and cons. I would say that most installations for server workloads prefer to use block level disk encryption because it's kind of simpler and more transparent. Uh, specifically at Cloudflare, we don't like using uh, self-encrypting dice or any kind of hardware encryption because uh, it's not audible. We cannot verify if it works properly. And there were many issues lately discovered with hardware disk encryption. They were so severe that even Microsoft decided to switch the default to use the software disk encryption in their BitLocker implementation. Okay, so uh, the so we were going to talk about block level disk encryption in Linux, which is basically Lux or DMCrypt module. Uh, so Lux uh, DMCrypt is part of the device mapper framework in Linux. So what is the device mapper? Again, we have the applications. They talk, they send files to the file system, files or streams file system convert to block I.O. and talk to the block device drivers. So device mapper can inject itself, like different modules can inject themselves in between the file system and the uh, block device drivers and can do value added services depending on what modules are implementing. So we have the RAID module, crypt module, we have the mirror module and, and many others. Uh, so let's zoom in to DMCrypt specifically. Uh, so DMCrypt itself, itself inserts itself between file system and block device drivers. And what it does, it's quite simple. It encrypts all the writes and decrypts all the reads. And the nice thing about it, it doesn't implement crypto on its own. So it uses standard Linux crypto API, which were actually uh, audited, nicely tested, and hopefully secure. The, many people looked at them. But uh, at some, like one of the uh, main products uh, from Cloudflare is actually our CDN, so content delivery network, so, and by definition, it should be fast. And at some point, we noticed problems that um, our CDN is not as fast as we would like it to be. And like due to some investigation, we pinpointed that we might have some performance issues in DMCrypt. So, but for the purposes of this talk, I would like to remove the bias of the hardware we encountered. Uh, so let's do a simple benchmark exercise just on, on RAM. So in Linux, you can easily create um, a block RAM, RAM disk. So it, it, it will create a virtual block device with, um, uh, and expose it in RAM and expose it to the, uh, to the system. And by the way, all this these comments were copy pasted from a real terminal. So consider it like as a real non-failing demo of, and then you can retrace the steps. So yeah, we will create, <laughs> we will create a block RAM device of four gigabytes. And uh, on top of that, we will uh, create, uh, install a DM mapper delay target with zero delay. I will uh, mention briefly later just why. And we will call it plain. Plain as because we, uh, read plain text data from it, read and write. And on top of this, we can create an encrypted device uh, with DMCrypt, and we will use Lux for simplicity, So, and we will call it secure. So in the end, we have this 
test storage tech setup. So we have the RAM disk, DM delay target, and DM crypt on top. Uh, so this is optional. Uh, the reason I uh, added it to my test storage stack is because the RAM disk, unfortunately, does not, does not expose any IOSTAT metrics. So when you want to compare uh, like unencrypted and encrypted reads and writes, you, don't, you, you have less data. So uh, conveniently, DM delay target, if you put a zero delay, uh, it just becomes a pass-through device, so it just doesn't add any overhead, but it actually exposes IOSTAT metrics, so you can have a, a feeling between uh, encrypted and unencrypted reads and writes. Yeah, uh, let's define a stand standard FIO job. So we will use direct IO here, and we will talk to devices directly uh, to remove the bias of the file system, uh, which might be added on top. Uh, so let's read from the plain device with 4K reads, and we will have roughly, like on my system, I had roughly 1.8 gigabyte per second throughput. If you do the same on the secure device, uh, on the encrypted device, uh, you get only 300 megabyte per second, which is very not great. Um, so we can see how our crypto is performing, right? We can run crypts and benchmark, and we can see that actual encryption decryption on my test system is also like roughly 1.8 gigabyte per second. Uh, so in the end, uh, like the man page for Creep setup says, don't consider this as a valid result because it uses RAM buffers for encryption decryption, not really storage hardware, but we created a RAM disk, right? We're, we're kind of on the same page here. So I would expect the uh, best case for us is to get somewhere around like 900 megabit, megabyte per second throughput through the encrypted device, but we have only 300. Uh, so maybe uh, we misconfigured something, so what we tried, we tried to switch to different cryptographic algorithms in DMCrypt, but actually the default AS XTS seems to be the fastest. We also experimented with some DMCrypt optional flags, um, but we didn't get any much uh, improvement. Uh, we also tried to consider uh, file system level encryption, but that ended up being even much, even more slower and uh, it's also potentially less secure because on file system level encryption, the metadata except the file names are not encrypted anymore. So you kind of like have more um, side channel data uh, for, uh, for, your, for your encrypted data. So we were in despair, so how, what to do? And we were so desperate, we actually went to the DMCrypt mailing list and provided the, some of these test results and saying, hey, uh, there's something wrong going on there, and we received a very like, concise response that you're probably unaware that encryption is a, a heavyweight operation, right? And like, I, I, I was wondering, is it, like, is it that heavyweight? So what is the most scientific way today to understand uh, if encryption is heavyweight or not? Yeah, you Google it, right? <laughs> so. so we Googled it, and actually, I ended up finding one of the results, our own company's blog post, where some of other, other engineers actually measured the, if, if crypto is expensive. Like, Cloudflare does a lot of TLS termination, so we process a lot of traffic, and most of this traffic is TLS and encrypted, so somebody already measured. And actually, the conclusion there that on real hardware, crypto is quite cheap, even at our scale, like with 200 data centers across the world. So uh, something didn't add up. So this is where we decided to look more closely into the AppCrypt implementation. So uh, this is the life of an encrypted block IO request. So you have the file system, the block device drivers, you install the AppCrypt and Crypto API. So in reality, while well, the file system sends the write, the AppCrypt doesn't process it immediately. It queues it into an asynchronous work queue. Uh, that queue then dispatches that request to Crypto API, which is again is also asynchronous in modern Linux kernel, and it queues again. And when the actual encryption happens, it sends it back to DMCrypt. Uh, but DMCrypt has another separate asynchronous queue for performing real I/O, so it, dispa uh, it queues there, and then it sends to another queue specifically designed for writes, which may sort the write I/Os before submitting them to block device drivers. 
A similar process for read. Again, okay, we first queue on the uh, crypt IO th thread, then we go to the block device subsystem, read the encrypted data, go to kcryptd queue, it, schedule it for decryption, send it to crypt API, queue there, then decrypt it, then actually send the result back. Then I remember that on one of the nice Usenic conferences, SRECon in Singapore, there was a nice presentation about totally different things about distributed system tail latency. And the one takeaway from there I remembered, which was in big letters, is that significant amount of tail latency is due to queuing effects. And with DMCrypt, we're actually having at least three or four queues for each bio request uh, when it passes through, through the stack. Uh, so I tried to understand why, why this happens, and like, I did a little bit of Git archaeology, and uh, kcrypd, the encryption queue was there from the beginning since the code was merged into the mainline uh, kernel. Originally it was done only for reads and said with the comment it would be very unwise to do decryption in an interrupt context, which is, sounds valid. Uh, some queuing was added in 2006 to actually reduce kernel stack usage. Uh, then the offloading writes and IO sorting, uh, write IO sorting was outed back in 2015. Uh, the co commit message says it was for spinning disks because spinning disk prefers sequential writes and dmcrypt kind of tends to break them because of the other queuing. And, but it also say it may improve SSDs, so maybe in 2015 SSDs prefer sequential writes. And, and it also mentioned it's better for CFQ scheduler, which is actually being deprecated now at all. So, yeah, and like we were not the first one to consider that this enormous queuing has some performance implications. So there were actually commits which added these optional flags, which we tried earlier, to disable some of the queues, but not all of them. Um, so we decided to reconsider, so like, the gist of it is that the most code was added with spinning disk in mind, where disk IO latency is much more than the scheduling latency, and you kind of don't feel the overhead of the extra queuing. Um, some bias in DMCrypt, uh, sorting bias in DMCrypt probably violates the do one thing and do it well Unix principle. So like it's a task of an IO scheduler, not the encryption module, to actually sort requests. And kcrypd may be redundant nowadays because it was added probably before the Linux Crypto API was asynchronous to not to do encryption in interrupt context, but now Crypto API is asynchronous by default, so like it should be smart enough actually not to do it in the first place. So we're just offloading the offload. So we decided to fix it. <laughs> and fixing it is just like, throw everything away and uh, basically get from this back to this. Synch <laughs> Synchronous <laughs> pass through with encryption decryption and also we wanted to remove the asynchronous behavior from the Linux crypto API just for this specific use case, right? So we have synchronous Linux API. So what we came up with is a simple patch which adds additional runtime flag to the encrypt module which bypasses all queues and asynchronous threads, but then uh, Linux Crypto API is a bit more complicated because Linux Crypto API basically, uh, by default, the Linux selects which specific crypto implementation will be used based on the priority and configuration, and most of that is asynchronous by default. And, but we wanted to take the leverage of the fact that we're modern, on modern x86 system, you have ASNI, and we wanted to make sure we use like the hardware ASNI instructions. Uh, but the implementation there is marked as internal, so external modules to crypto API cannot directly reference the synchronous ASNI uh, internal implementation. And also there was this problem that indeed in some not all interrupt contexts, but some interrupt contexts, ASNI you cannot you cannot use the SNI because SNI uses the FPU register and FPU context is not preserved by the Linux kernel in some times. So to take that, to fix all that, we wrote like an additional uh, crypto API module which we'll call like XTX proxy. It's uh, a dedicated synchronous IS XTS implementation 
but it doesn't implement crypto on its own, so it, effectively it's just like an if else clause. So we check if in the current, con when we receive an encryption decryption request, we just check if we can use FPU in this context. If yes, we forward the request to the internal ISNI implementation. We can do that because crypto API modules can call other internal crypto API modules. And if not, we just fall back to the uh, IS generic software implementation, which actually doesn't need FPI, uh, FPU. But this happens very rarely, uh, or on some hardware it doesn't happen at all. It depends on the implementation of the driver. And it's fully synchronous, there is no floating. Uh, so the way how you can use it, again, we restart our FIO job. This time we will start in read-write mode to actually check the both read and write paths. Um, then we load our custom uh, crypto API module so it's available. Then we can tweak our existing, uh, uh, existing DMCrypt uh, the nice thing about this, this all based on a runtime flag. So you, we started the I.O. job early, so I.O. workload is going just now, so you can, you can do it in live production without any interruption. So, uh, so we do this comment. What it effectively does is basically we use the new DMCrypt interface telling not to let the operating system select the crypto implementation for us, but specifically use our XTX proxy model, which we just loaded, and we also enable our, uh, our, to bypass all the queues with our new flag, which our patch added. And for th systems to take the effect, you, you need to do this small comment. And the results. So uh, uh, read throughput, this is where we enable our flag. It doubles the same for write throughput. Uh, when you flip the flag, the right throughput double. So basically, uh, we had roughly around 300 megabyte per second. Uh, uh, now we have 600 megabyte per second, which is still not 900, but it's much, much closer than that. Uh, and what about IO latency? So it's very hard to measure IO latency still on the, um, on the RAM disk because it's so fast and efficient. So this is the graph from our real production system where we enabled the flag, so here. Um, I had to remove numbers here uh, on the access because I was lazy enough to ask uh, permission to do it. <laughs> but that's not important. The important part here is that this graph is linear. So uh, yellow line is our real SSD disk under load and production. Uh, the green line is the DM crib abstraction on top of it, and we can see from the metrics that like DMCrypt adds like 100% IO latency overhead. The moment we enable our, uh, we disable all the queuing and enabling in-line processing, we are like, we actually like decreasing both. Well, that's basically it. So here are some conclusions here that, uh, we have a simple patch which may improve the group performance by uh, 200 or even in some cases 300%. Uh, it's actually fully compatible with stock Linux DMCrypt implementation, so we didn't invent any new algorithms, we didn't change any formats, so your encrypted disk with DMCrypt can be already like applied here. And it also, which is a nice thing for us, can be enabled, disabled at runtime without service disruption. And we can, that's why we can easily do like A-B testing on a, on a live production system to see if it actually brings any benefit. We confirmed that modern crypto is fast and cheap, especially if you have like hardware acceleration in, in your CPUs. Uh, and you, if you see the performance degradation and and you think it's because crypto, look elsewhere. It's usually it's not the crypto. Uh, and extra queuing may be harmful on uh, more than low latency storage. So it wasn't the case for spinning disks. So as storage becomes much more faster, and especially with new NVMe things, uh, the queuing is, needs to be reviewed. There are some 
caveats and which, I mean, this patch was quickly made to actually fix our workflow. Uh, I did some more measurements and it actually, the current version of the patch improves performance on slow, small block sizes or high ops workload. If you actually try to do like the tip point is two megabyte block size, the performance even becomes worse than it was with queuing and I still don't understand why, uh, but I'll investigate it or if somebody has any ideas, let, let me know. Uh, so it's kind of like tailored to the small uh, block IO workloads. Um, again, the whole setup they assumes hardware accelerated crypto. So if you want to do inline encryption processing, it's uh, it's probably not still not very wise to do it completely in software in interrupt context because the hardware accelerated crypto uh, gives you like much. Uh, better overhead and so like if you don't have hardware acceleration then probably uh, this whole setup will not work for you and because of that the current XTX proxy implementation only supports x86 because it explicitly calls ASNI implementation. We might look into doing something similar to ARM as well. And uh, of course your mileage may vary. Uh, don't rush to deploy it into your systems uh, measure first. And with the runtime flag, you can do a simple A-B test and see if it actually improves performance for you. And also, we will be very interested in, in results, in your results. So yeah, some links. Uh, the Crypt Setup project, which, which has a nice wiki around Crypt Setup locks and DM Crypt in general. Uh, DM setup man page, of course, and the final link is uh, to our GitHub repo where the patches are uh, published today. So you can go and download them. That's it. I think we I even have time for questions, do I? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Anyone? Questions? Where are the patches? The last final link on GitHub. because they are not generic enough for inclusion. The Linux... Send them out anyway. That's way too certain. Yeah, so... so we already... <laughs> yeah, that, that was actually going to be my question, which is uh, what has the response been from the device mapper community to the patch, which sort of presumes you've sent it out to them, but, you know, maybe I'm assuming too much. <laughs> we didn't send it out yet, so the only response I have, which I showed earlier, was that we are unaware that encryption is expensive, so once, I don't want to send it before, I just want to first at least try to understand why it's not that great on a large block device, uh, uh, large bio uh, bias. Uh, well, maybe, and it's either I'd, to fix it or maybe to propose some kind of a like, um, more intelligent uh, logic where when to use inline encryption, where not to use inline encryption. But yeah, surely, uh, we will send them soon. So. Okay. And and certainly your your performance improvements are seem compelling yeah. at the beginning. Right? <laughs> Oh, Chad NetApp, I, I thought you should just reply to that email and just say, ha ha, when they have a picture of your results or something. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be better. <laughs> right. um, actually, I, I missed, uh, maybe you mentioned why you wouldn't use self-encrypting drives, which seem to have much best, better performance. Is it purely cost issue? Or why, why go with the software encryption? Uh, basically, it's more trust and security. So if you just, again, do the scientific research by Googling, uh, <laughs> you will see that like last year, I think there were a lot of CVs and security issues reported uh, to like vendors regarding disk encryption. That's because the standard, which is called OPAL, it actually provides guidance, but it wasn't specific enough. So like yeah. vendors implemented that in, it's because he trusts software engineers more than hardware engineers. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> Maybe, yes. Yeah. So, so uh, every software engineer, but the ones uh, that he can check out what they've actually done. <laughs> yeah, this is, uh, so uh, some of my colleagues who've been working on the inline crypto support um, from Android, uh, one of the interesting things in uh, some of the ARM ecosystem is that they have inline crypto, which is defined, it's AES, and you can actually turn it off and access it bypassing the inline crypto. Mm -hmm. So one of the things we were able to do was to use the inline crypto to encrypt mm -hmm. and then bypass decrypt and verify that in fact, it was in fact doing AES, XDS or whatever, <laughs> right? Um, you know, we can't guarantee that the SOC isn't broadcasting the key, you know, in wireless form or something like that, mm -hmm. but in terms of actually verifying whether or not uh, the inline crypto was doing the inline crypto you thought it was, there do exist uh, some hardware accelerators, like I said, in the ARM ecosystem where I have some Android colleagues that are actively working on this for FScript, can actually do the right thing. Uh, I'm not aware of any of that showing up on x86 yet, um, but maybe we can encourage them. <laughs> I actually look into the, the Android uh, tree uh, like for Nexus or like what's the new, they have this new device, but this is a separate device, right? Yeah. So you kind of, you invoke the device and then you verify the result. Whereas with self-encrypting drives, it's, it's, yeah, yeah. you do, yeah. you. Yeah. And Ted, yeah. Ted the, 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 the inline crypto that some of the Android stuff does, it's actually in no way related to the ARM CPU. It just happens to sit in the same SOC. Yeah, it's yeah, it's in the same the SOC. Yeah. I, I said ARM ecosystem. And not all of the SOC implementations of inline crypto are validly done. And some of them have truly unspeakable kernel patches to enable them. I'm talking about the latest stuff, not some of the stuff but from even last year. Now that we're year. getting into <laughs> this interesting use case discussion, I think we might want to jump on to the next talk, which is kind of <laughs> going in a similar direction. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Ignat. Yep. Uh,